Hi, good evening all. This is Vishal Singhal from Shellstrat. Uh, I am co-founder and AI evangelist for the company. Today we have Mr. Bismillah Kani. He, uh, he is the AI researcher with Shellstrat AI Lab. He will be taking us through classification of imbalanced data as a topic today. Uh, so I'll transfer the controls to him. Uh, I suggest uh, if you have any questions, you can, you can keep them coming. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on our Shellstrat YouTube channel, although for Prime members only, you I'll share, share the details in between about our Prime membership as well as uh, where you can see the recording. And uh, uh, we will try to answer all the questions towards the end, unless they are slight critical. So I suggest you can keep your questions coming as and when they come to your mind. So Bismillah, I'm transferring the control to you. Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead, uh, share your screen. Yeah, um, okay, I'll start with my question. Yeah. So you see my screen now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hello all, uh, uh, welcome to the webinar today. And uh, thank you for taking time to join this webinar. So today's uh, topic of the webinar is uh, classification of uh, imbalance uh, data set. Um, the content. Um, okay, so the content of uh, today's uh, presentation is as follows. Uh, we'll start with an introduction of uh, what is an imbalance data set is about. And then we we'll move on to the metrics uh, of uh, what kind of metrics to be used for such imbalance data set. And then the major part of the presentation is about the techniques that can be used to address the problems that is faced in this imbalance data set. And finally, I will show you a full demo how to apply these techniques to one of the imbalance data set and how can we improve the performance of the model. <clears throat> Yeah, to begin with, uh, an imbalance classification is a uh, task uh, which has a data set where the classes of those data sets are disproportionate or it is not equal. Ideally, uh, for a classification task, uh, it would be good if there is a 50 50. Uh, distribution of a uh, class. If it is a binary class, if it is like a 50% of positive class and 50% of negative class. However, this is not the case always. There is always a certain degree of disproportionate of this class distribution. Uh, however, when this distribution becomes so severe, then the, uh, we used to face uh, problems and uh, and we will see how to address those problems in this presentation uh certain examples of this imbalance cl classification is the well-known uh, problem that is the spam or ham classification as we know that uh, the, the the number of examples of spam emails or not that much. It is always uh, very less as compared to the total number of examples we have. Another example would be the credit card fraud detections. As we know, the frauds are always rare to occur, uh, but it is very sensitive. Another example would be the cancer prediction. So where uh, the normal or uh, you know non-disease patients number will be very high, compared to the cancer disease patients. So in this uh, uh, class, uh, imbalance uh, classification, so we have uh, two class. Uh, one is the majority class. Uh, so if, if the number of uh, examples belong to this class is more than the half, then this class is called majority class. Mostly, this majority class will be a negative. For example, in spam is a scam classifier, the negative class is non spam emails, or it could be an, a normal uh, emails. That's what that is mentioned here. In minority class, is always that uh, 
uh, it is less than half of the samples and it is often the positive class in spam and emails it is the spam emails or the abnormal piece also there is uh, we can call it as slight imbalance uh, problem and also severe imbalance problem in slight imbalance problem maybe we can solve it but when the imbalance becomes very severe we need to apply certain techniques so that we can uh, improve the performance and also when come when we look into the data set and how the two classes are separate that also directly address how severity a severe problem this imbalance could add to it see when this i saw here uh, three types of uh, class uh, or class separability the top one is actually um, uh, it is totally overlapped so in such cases the all already the classification of these two classes is difficult and when you have such a very severe imbalance it the difficulty becomes very tough actually <clears throat> but on the other hand when these two classes are clearly separable then the imbalance doesn't have much impact so the the effect of imbalance or the severity of imbalance is actually uh, directly linked to how the class separability is now before we move on to the techniques that can be used to address this imbalance problem let us recall some of the metrics that should be used in particularly for uh, imbalance classification because normally in most of the classification problems we we tend to use accuracy as one of the metrics but uh, accuracy is good uh, but especially for imbalance uh, classification this accuracy could be very misleading so for example the spam or non spam emails so 90% of your uh, examples will be non spam emails and only 10% can be uh, spam emails so a very naive uh, classifier which says all the examples to be uh, non spam email will easily have an accuracy of 90% so although it number looks high but it is very misleading so that is why for imbalance data set we always uh, uh, avoid uh, to use accuracy as metrics and use other metrics uh, which we will discuss now <clears throat> so this here uh, all the metrics are based on the confusion matrix as shown here so confusion matrix i think uh, last week we have an uh, very detailed session on the uh, matrix so we will just uh, recall it uh, uh, what is the confusion matrix? Is. So, confusion matrix is that uh, you have the uh, actual uh, values and you have the predicted values. And if for a positive class, if, if a positive class is predicted as a positive class, then we call it as true positive. If a negative class is predicted as a negative class, then we call it as true negative. But the other way around, if a negative class is uh, if a negative class actually is a negative, but it is predicted to be positive, then we call it as false positive. So actual class is a positive, but the model predicted to be negative, then we call it as false negative. So based on this confusion matrix, we can calculate several metrics that can be used as a uh, model matrix for imbalanced data set. So the first metrics will be called as the precision. So the precision is nothing but the ratio of the true positive divided by <coughs> true positives, um, true positive plus false positives. And what is the intuition behind precision is that it will tell us how confident the model is when it predicts a class. So if it predicts an email to be an uh, spam or non-spam, it will tell you like how confident, how trustable that prediction is. 
and also another matrix is called recall. Recall is the ratio of true positive uh, to the sum of true positives and false negatives. <clears throat> so recall will tell us what is the model ability to detect a class, whether it is a uh, spam or non-spam. Since these two, it, there is like two metrics which tells two different information. So we want to combine this into an, an, an one score, which is taken a harmonic mean of precision and recall, which is given as F1 score, which is shown by this formula. <clears throat> so, uh, so using precision and recall, we can get some intuition of how the model is performing. If it has a high recall and high precision, then we can say that the model is performing good. But if it has a low recall and high precision, as I explained before, the model can detect the, cannot detect the class properly, but when it detects, it is highly trustable. When it has a high recall and low precision, the model can detect the classes, but it includes some uncertainty. So that is the uh, so it is not very precise. Of course, the low low recall and low uh, precision says that our model is performing poorly. So to, to continue with the metrics, I think uh, the most important or most intuitive metrics to use for imbalanced data set would be the area under the ROC curve. So ROC curve is nothing but uh, the uh, receiver operating characteristics. So to plot an ROC curve, so first we need to calculate the true positive rate and the false positive rate. And if you plot the false positive rate against the true positive rate, so you will get a graph. You will get a curve is something like this. The diagonal red dotted line indicates actually an, uh, a naive classifier. <clears throat> So, which has an area under the curve of 0 0.5. So, when they, uh, uh, this actually indicates a very worse performing model. When you move above the graph, the model starts performing better and better. And when it reaches this point, which is the maximum area under the curve of 1, you can say the model is the best model. So, so you you will be getting something between 0 0.5 to 1 the area under the curve so to give you and some context <clears throat> here i show you three different models one is a low performing model on the left side and one is a medium performing model in the middle and also in a high performing model so having explained the metrics, I think now we can go into the different techniques that can be used for uh, addressing the problems of uh, <clears throat> imbalance class, imbalance uh, data set. So uh, yeah, one of the simplest technique uh, that, uh, that we might use straight away using a scalar library is to use a, a compute class weight uh, function. So what does this uh, compute class weight uh, function does is that it gives you a different weights to the uh, loss of each class. So positive class and negative class, it, uh, it gives different weights. And by giving different weights, it uh, penalizes the, uh, the loss in a different way. So it penalizes the minority class more and it penalizes the majority class less so that the model, when it learns, it gives more weight to the minority class. And when it uh, finishes the training and optimize the weights, the model will take into account the uh, imbalance distribution of the class and it gives you a better uh, <clears throat> performance. So in the scalar uh, API, you can just call the compute class weight and you can pass this weight to any classifier like logistic regression or classifier, forest classifier. <clears throat> so when you, when you choose balanced, 
so what it how it calculates weights is that it takes the ratio of total number of samples and divided by the total number of classes and to the frequency of that class so the weight is inversely proportional to the frequency of the class and uh, now uh, we will see some data uh, resampling techniques so data resampling techniques are actually uh, uh, two types one is oversampling another is undersampling so the in oversampling the basic technique is called the random oversampler so the random oversampler is nothing but a very naive method with just randomly uh, um, uh, selects the minority class and simply makes a duplicate copies of those minority class so that the number of uh, minority class and the majority class becomes equal so before resampling the distribution is like this the minority class is very less and you do an oversampling and then you just make random copies of the minority class such that the numbers becomes more or less equal so this is a very basic uh, techniques and there are some other uh, uh, sophisticated techniques and uh, as we uh, explained in random oversampling it does not generate new example it just makes a copy of the existing samples but uh, i will explain you several techniques now where we can generate new techniques so one such technique is called a smoot smoot is an abbreviation for synthetic minority oversampling technique where it generates new samples of the minority class by interpolating in uh, interpolating the minority classes so how a small smart works is uh, as illustrated in this example uh, <clears throat> it will uh, randomly select one of the minority class and uh, what it uh, says that for the randomly selected minority class xi it will find uh, k nearest neighbors let's say if the k is equal to 5 then it finds the five nearest neighbors for that randomly selected uh, minority class and out of the five uh, nearest neighbors it randomly picks one of the nearest neighbors and it computes the difference between the minority class xi and the nearest neighbor xz and uh, the difference is multiplied with a random number between 0 to 1 uh, in here which is indicated as lambda and that value which is the difference multiplied by a random number is added to the original minority uh, sample and then we have a newly generated new sample so by doing this we are actually uh, interpolating between the minority sample and the nearest neighbor sample this lambda will determine will randomly put this x nu to be somewhere in between this so it can be here or it can be here or it can be here so that is how it uh, works mm. so that is smart and after smart has been published uh, uh, that uh, 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 a few variants of smoot has been published so whatever i explained in the previous slide it is called a regular smoot so there is other variants such as borderline smoot so what is borderline smoot is how borderline smoot is different from the regular smoot is that in smart it randomly picks the minority sample and it creates a new uh, uh, it creates a new example but in borderlines uh, smart all the minority class first it is uh, divided into three uh, classes okay how this is divided is that for each minority class we compute the k nearest neighbors and if all the nearest neighbors of that particular minority example 
is of or of a different class, then we 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 mark that uh, minority example exercise as a noise. Let's say if at least half of the nearest to neighbors are of the same class as minority class, then we call those we mark those uh, exercise as danger. And if all the nearest neighbors, uh, the k nearest neighbors, are of the same class as the minority class xi, then we mark it as safe. Then what we do is we only apply those uh, sample synthetic sample generation only for this uh, danger uh, uh, samples. So as we compare with SMART, SMART randomly picks uh, uh, minority classes and and then it interprets the data. But in borderline SMART, we class first we up. Uh, classify the minority class into three classes and then we apply the interpolation only for those which has been identified as danger category so that is called borderline smart and there is one more variant called svm smart so this is nothing as the name implies uh, uh, it first applies an svm classifier and it identifies the borderline border points or the support vectors uh, between the minority class and majority class and then only applies or interpolates those xi from the support vectors so that is called hvm smart and uh, another technique is uh, called uh, adasin so so okay this also is similar to smart but it uh, it 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 differs from smart in the way they generate uh, samples so this is called the adaptive synthetic sampling approach and it also is as i said that this is similar to smart and the only the difference is that uh, in smart for every sample every sample there is equal number of uh, samples will be generated so for example if you have a 90 majority class and 10 minority class and if you want to make the uh, minority class equal to the majority class then what we'll do is for each minority class that is one minority class is for each minority will be generating 10 samples right then only we will be coming then only the number of minority class will be close to the majority class but in Adasin, what it does is that not all 10 uh, minority class examples or uh, um, will have 10 uh, synthetic examples. One will have more and another will have less. But how they decide, they will compute an uh, <clears throat> density called Ri. So it is based on how, uh, how, how it is close to the majority class and then based on that ratio or right it will decide how many number of samples to be uh, generated for that uh, minority class example xi so that is the major difference between adasin and smart so by doing this adasin will give more uh, more importance to the outliers uh, as compared to smart where smart gives uh, equal importance but adasin will give more importance to the outliers uh, so the techniques that so far i explained is all about uh, oversampling uh, now the the other data resampling technique is called undersampling so that is an opposite of oversampling so let's say you have a majority class so the, what it will does is uh, uh, it will try to reduce the majority class uh, the number of examples so that it becomes then uh, equal to the minority class so as i explained for oversampling it is also called a random undersampler it is a very naive implementation which just randomly selects uh, the majority class and that it just uh, removes those but there are uh, other techniques uh, uh, such as uh, near miss so near miss what it's it has actually three variants near miss one two and three 
in near miss one uh, what it does is that um, um, for each uh, majority class <clears throat> it computes the uh, it takes the uh, nearest neighbors for example in this uh, uh, graph uh, i have shown you three nearest neighbors so and uh, it it computes the average uh, distance of this so for this majority class the distance to the three nearest neighbors the average distance is um, 1.13 and for this majority class the three nearest neighbors are three and the average distance would be 0 0.96 and then what it will do is that it will uh, it will it will uh, it will take those majority class examples with the minimum average distance to the three closest uh, minority class examples. So let's say if you have uh, 90 uh, majority class and you want to make it to uh, 10, so it will it will first compute this average distance based on the based on the nearest neighbors and it shorts down and it finds the uh it, it, it selects the class, majority class examples with the minimum average distance yeah so near miss 2 is another variant it is exactly it's almost same as uh, near miss 1 only thing is instead of computing the distance between the uh, nearest examples uh, nearest minority points it will compute the distance to the furthest uh, minority class examples Mm. And then there is another variant where it will not take the nearest or farthest, but it will take to each minority class examples. So for this, it will compute all the distance and it computes an average of that. And then you short it based on the minimum distance. There's a one more technique for under sampling. It is called uh, Tomat links. Uh, Okay, so that's uh, that's the name in place. It it, it identify a link which uh, by the name by the author. It's called Tomek links. A Tomek link is is defined as two observations where uh, x and y belongs to a different class. Where here in this case it is a minority class and majority class, and then it these two these two examples becomes the nearest neighbors to each other so it which means that there is no other example which have a distance less than this distance so the the minimum distance to another example is the uh, is this and also for this example the nearest neighbor is this that is what explained in this equation so if when such uh, tomat links exist that then we remove this majority class um actually what they say in this paper is that it might not achieve uh, because we are not uh, under sampling that much we are just removing only small examples where these links might exist you can I imagine that there may not be so many such links in a data set uh, it depends on how the data set is distributed. If they are very close by, yes, then such links can be many more. And so you can remove uh, many majority class. But when the uh, distribution is not such, then it will only help you in cleaning the data set. And one more technique is actually the edited nearest neighbors. Mm. Uh, so what it does is that uh, for for an instance A in the data set, it will first compute its uh, k nearest neighbors, for example, three nearest neighbors. If A is a majority class, okay, and if it is being misclassified by its three nearest neighbors, then A is removed from the data set. But if if it is A is a minority class, then the three nearest neighbors are removed. So that is the edited uh, nearest neighbors. So in this way, you can uh, under sample the majority class. 
So I can ask the question, la? Yeah, sure. So, which of these techniques is better? Uh, see, I think you should uh, start with the simplest approach, uh, which is the class weight. You see if it helps. Um, and then go for a uh, combination of uh, under sampling and over sampling. So that is uh, what is recommended in uh, literatures. So you can say first to uh, uh, you can try smart. Uh, okay, you can also uh, uh, try nearness. But I think uh, what literature says that uh, it will lead to overfitting. So it is better to have a combination techniques. Let's say like first you do uh, over sampling and then you do under sampling. Okay, and uh, would you be sharing the link to paper? Yes, all the links to the papers are here. I can give you this slide uh, presentation sure. and also sure. I will give you the code. Yeah? Fine, ah, okay, okay. thanks. So if there are no further questions, I can go for the code demo. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, okay. So in this, I tried to demonstrate uh, these techniques. Um, okay, more first I'll coming. show you the... Some more are coming, so let's wait for some time. So uh, next question is how to decide either to go over sampling or under sampling? In what situations? Mm. Yeah, most of the case, I think uh, over sampling is the preferred uh, case where you will uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 you will uh, increase the minority class examples to the majority class. So this also is like a trial and error approach only. I don't think anybody can give you an approach that uh, yeah, this technique will work. So you can yeah, so. Uh, try it out different techniques. But uh, in literature, I see that uh, the combination technique is uh, more advisable. Yeah, I do believe it's very experimental. So you have to go by the gut mm -hmm. uh, initially. Yes, correct. Okay. Also, it, uh, also, it is not guaranteed that uh, these techniques uh, can help you. It depends on the data set you have and also how the classes are separated and uh, how the sensitivity of the problem is. Uh, right. Yeah, sometimes okay. it helps. It is not guaranteed or that it, uh, it, it can elevate your accuracy to one totally another level. It will help. Sure. Yeah, depends on the problem. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay, so so I think uh, the library or the API to use is called the AIMLearn, which I show here. It's a very good API. Um, uh, so it has uh, implemented all those techniques like oversampling, undersampling. So here you see the naive implementation as a random oversampler, smooth, Hadassi, borderline smooth, and assume smooth. And also the near miss from links and the editor nearest neighbors. <clears throat> also, they have a pipeline where you can you know make a combination of this. So I just implemented some helper functions. Um, so here I show you how the data is before resampling and after applying uh, smooth. So here uh, there is like something like 9,000, something like uh, a majority class and like 100 uh, minority class. But when you apply SMOT, also there is a hyperparameter called strategy. So it means like uh, whether you want, if it is one, it means that it both uh, majority and minority class will have equal number of samples. So as shown here, before uh, resampling, which has 9,900 and it was 100. After resampling, both have a uh, same. But if you change the strategy to 0.5 or something, 
then it will have 50 percent of the majority class it means it will have something around 4500 samples so you can another, try the mm -hmm. another question is uh, what about computational powers needed for this can we use normal cpu itself or higher would be required yeah i think it is very lightweight it doesn't need yeah okay yeah this is like a scale on liability yeah. Sure. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. This is uh, how the smart will looks. Mm. And another, I'm not able to score. Okay. Uh, here I show you some undersampling techniques. Um, so here the distribution was nine thousand nine hundred and hundred. So I applied an undersample technique near miss three with a strategy of point two so um what it happens is that uh, the minority class is as, as as it is but the majority class is been reduced to 226 okay so uh, as you see uh, like we are losing a lot of data here so probably yeah it might be preferable to do over sampling rather than under sampling uh, but as uh, we shall uh, mention, it is always an experiment. Um, so another thing is that the combination one. So you can have a pipeline, um, the oversampling pipeline, where uh, it will apply. Uh, okay, I can show you that here. Okay. So in this, what it does is that. Uh, it, it creates a pipeline. So first it applies an oversample and then it does an undersample. So oversample, you can uh, choose some of the techniques like smart or anything. And then you can do a, just a simple random sampler. So that is a combination, how you can use combinations. <clears throat> So as you can see, if you apply only smart, it looks like this. So it sees that some are redundant. So you can then apply an uh, undersampler on the minority class. Then you can remove some you know, uh, redundant uh, uh, minority examples. Then the distribution becomes much better, you see. Yeah, this is just a demo of how we to use the uh, Imblur library. Now we will see an uh, actual example. So in this, I'm showing you a classification of wine samples. So I'm using the data from the uh, data from the, uh, the UCI library, uh, machine learning database. So in this, they have a wine quality database, and the quality is rated between uh, zero to nine or uh, one to ten, I think. So what I did, what I did is that, uh, so um, they, uh, in this uh, examples, um, most of the wine qualities are uh, normal qualities. There are very few excellent qualities and very few uh, poor qualities. So I just make the excellent and poor qualities to be as one class and the remaining normal quality as one class. So we want to apply a classification to identify it, whether it is a normal wine quality or excellent or poor wine quality. So our data distribution is looks yeah, something like this. So the zero class is uh, four, something around 5,000 and one class is around two. So this is clearly uh, an imbalance. Uh, Another question has come, Bismillah. Uh, and gentlemen is saying, in spite of over sample or under sample, don't we end up having higher mean square error then? Mean square error um, of what? I am doing a classification here, so I don't have a mean square error here. Oh, uh, so I request the gentleman to please elaborate the question because it's not understood well. Thank you. Yeah, so we are doing a classification here. Yeah, okay. In regression data. Yeah. 
regression data no this is clearly tells no classification yeah okay okay mm, okay so then i have this data set so now i am going to apply uh, my techniques so now i have written some resampling pipeline so it will apply uh, you know a normal without resampling how will be the accuracy and after applying different uh, resamplings how the accuracy will be so first i am using a logistic regression so and then i am applying that uh, resampling pipeline so you can see the how the numbers uh, changed so before it was 3760 and after that it changed uh, it the minor take uh, increased to 3000 so it became same as the majority so likewise i'm just showing you how the different processes are done but um, the main focus would be how we compare the model performance <clears throat> so here the blue horizontal line shows the baseline <clears throat> performance of this logistic regression without doing any resampling that's what it's shown here so without doing any uh, resampling the excuse me so uh, somebody is asking can you share the github link where it is placed so we will go through where while you are explaining itself yeah okay. do you have a github how to copy this yeah can you uh, send send it to me in message i will put it there Oh, uh, I'm not in WhatsApp in my desktop. No, no, to... no, 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 no. I am sending it to you over go to webinar. You must be seeing three dotted links on the toolbar. Just reply to that with your GitHub link. Oh. And uh, while you do that, uh, yeah, I've got this. I'll posting it to the audience. Uh, also mm -hmm. you can answer to the another question can you uh, for classification don't we end up with more error components false positives and false negatives for classification don't be after resampling um, I've shared the GitHub link. Uh, you can answer to this question. Yeah. Yes, after resampling, he's saying. Yeah, uh, since we are increasing the number of the examples, uh, the also automatically the, yeah, the misclassified uh, false positive and false negative tends to increase uh, but uh, also it helps you in getting you a better uh, uh, decision boundary uh, instead of uh, having a boundary that is totally biased to a majority class you will have a boundary or a decision plane that is balanced and that is why your uh, area under the curve of a uh, uh, ROC curve will be much better. <clears throat> okay. Mm, yeah. So here I show you a comparison of uh, different uh, resampling techniques and without resampling, what will be your area under the curve score? So the, the blue line shows you a uh, very baseline. So here in this case, using logistic regression, it was not able to classify properly. So the, it was a worst model with the area under the score of 0.5. Uh, and with uh, using different resampling techniques, in this case, we are using under sample. Uh, you will see that uh, the, the area under the score has improved a lot. So this is uh, using under sampling technique. Uh, this is uh, using over sampling technique like a smart and as in bottling smart. And this is uh, using uh, combinations that is uh, smart and then applying an under sampler, which I showed you before. Um, okay, so now that is logistic regression and you can also use a more sophisticated classifier like a random force classifier 
so um, in that you see that the model without resampling itself is uh, performing better than logistic regression so the a AUC curve is uh, 0.6 so now you see the class weight uh, um, uh, just class weight uh, technique doesn't help much but the other techniques like uh, yeah, near maze or the random sampler have helped to improve the performance of the model and uh, yeah and also the combination model works much better so you can use a a, a borderline smart app followed by an under sampler then you can see the a auc scores is much better so this by this we show that uh by using data resampling techniques like smart addressing or real miss you can improve the uh, model performance uh, but it is not always yeah the question so uh, this data is on totally unseen test data right uh what do you mean by unseen the question is uh is this this data that you are using is this uh, on totally unseen test data the uh, all the exercise that you have done is this on yes. totally unseen data or this yes, is not on synthetic data or training data see first we have the total data set and then uh, what we do is uh, we split the data into train and uh, test x train x y train like that and then we do resampling only on the train data. Okay, so this is also another point. You should not apply your uh, resampling techniques directly on the entire data set. Then you will be ending up in overfitting because you should apply your resampling only on the train data set. You fit the model and then you evaluate your model on the test data. Okay, and another question is, uh... You have written so much of code for sampling here. Is this instant code to use new data sets? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I just uh, written something so that, uh, yeah, it is very easy. You, I would suggest to go and look into the Inblood library. Uh, it is just by one line of code, uh, you can uh, call those uh, reset. Okay. Uh, yeah or uh, I have given the GitHub link, uh, you can also go through the code. It is not uh, very complicated, uh, it is so easy to understand. If you have any doubt, you can uh, send me a link. Sure, thanks. Okay, and uh, then I show you one more example. I think this is very famous in Angle. So this credit card uh, data, we can also apply this uh, techniques for credit card data. So uh, in this in this the balance is even more severe. You see, it is like almost like two hundred two point five something uh, of of uh, zero class, and it's very less uh, 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 two lakh eighty four thousand of uh, zero class, and just mere five hundred class. Yeah. So the imbalance is very severe. So. I am going to apply an um, apply a logistic regression for this. So, if you apply a logistic regression, you see the AUC is something around 0.8. By using resampling techniques, you can elevate the accuracy to above uh, 90%. It's almost like a 0.95 till 95%. You can achieve the accuracy. So I am showing you, and uh, I didn't do any uh, kind of uh, you know, further feature engineering or feature thing, and then apply it. I directly applied the data resampling on the original features itself. You can also add more uh, feature engineering techniques, and then finally you do data resampling. It will even improve or uh, your perform model perform. So there are many uh, literatures that are available online. You can go through it. So for the webinar purpose, I will just show you one basic uh, implementation and comparison.
Yeah, I think uh, that is about the code demo. Um, and uh, so all the papers and all the you know the references have been listed here. I can also give this presentation to Vishal and he can place it somewhere. And if you have um, more questions or we if you want to discuss on this, you can reach me on this email. Questions are coming. So, uh, is the AUC metric shown here calculated on train data set? If yes, then is there any evaluation done on test set? Uh, I have to see. I think it is calculated on test data set. Actually, I have not loaded the data, so it is difficult for me to run again. If well, I will, if I can also rerun it if it is on the train, and then I can post the results. So I will update the GitHub. Yeah, um, so the AEC is applied on the test data. Yeah. So what you do is you split the data into train, uh, uh, train and test, and then you apply your resampling on the um, train, uh, train data, and you fit the model on the resampled data, and then you evaluate your model on the test data. Is this clear? Yeah, so. Can you see uh, the code? Or maybe I'll show you a simple version of this code or something. So, for example, these are the undersampling techniques, and um, yeah, you have the X train, on Y train, train data. So you take a sampler and then fit it, and you get a, a resampled data, and you fit your model on the resampled data, and you evaluate your model on the tested data. Some people are already saying excellent presentation and explanation. Uh, no, okay. They are looking forward to more sessions from you in future. Yeah, thank you, sir. Happy to hear. So, okay. Um, any, uh, so we yeah. have uh, we have eight more minutes to go. Uh, but if uh, if you have any questions, you can send now, or else we'll close the webinar. So I've already shared the self shared YouTube link as well as uh, uh, the self shared Prime uh, details if you would like to join because this uh, webinar recording will be available to Prime members primarily. Uh, you can ask your question by typing it. We cannot allow uh, the speaking part of it. Any other questions? Uh, so we have quite a few uh, webinars lined up for March as well as I think already almost 22 webinars in April. Uh, very, very good uh, reinforcement learning, driverless cars and other <laughs> topics are coming uh, uh, in April, uh, starting April. And uh, and we'll be having some more with Bismillah from April or May. Uh, March is all already uh, booked out. So, uh, uh, yeah. Thank so, you, uh, one, Vishal. Uh, no, yeah. Okay. Gentleman is asking to go back to the ROC AUC method you passed in prediction instead of problems. The code. Can you go to that slide? Slide or code where you discussed about ROC AUC method. Okay. So he's saying uh, you passed in prediction instead of problems. The code he said. You you called? He's, he's asking for code.
So I don't understand. So hold. He said, "Please go to uh, ROC AUC method. You passed in predictions instead of problems. Prediction score or probabilities instead of uh, like predictions uh, instead of probabilities." Uh, well, this is how the QC score is uh, for. I have to check it on that. Maybe you can send me the question in detail through email. So uh, maybe I will. So, so if you can uh, go to your slide where your contact details are there, uh, yeah, sure. or you can or you can share the GitHub link, small GitHub link on your uh, contact slide. So probably people can uh, contact you there and ask any questions they have. In the GitHub only. Yeah, you can you can yeah copy this GitHub link to that. Yeah. So you all can uh, contact him through either email or or GitHub link, and uh, he will be able to respond there. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So. Thank you all. Thanks for attending. And we had audience from uh, Western countries as well. So good day to all of you there and good night to all in India. Thank you, Bismillah, and uh, look forward to more sessions from you in future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vishal. Uh, good night. Bye.